focus on verses 19 and 20 but let's, let me make a couple of comments about the, the preceding uh, verses uh, the 11 that's mentioned there are the apostles because you know G uh, Judas betrayed Jesus so he he's out but that this is the this is the apostles representative of uh, really the first and early church uh, the fact that some doubted probably is an indication that it's not that they doubted that Jesus arose, but maybe they just doubted that this was him. And of course, he uh, did away with their doubts when he said, All power is given unto me uh, in heaven and in earth, signifying uh, whose he was, whose son he was, and that he was that he was God. But verses 19 and 20 
It's what we call the Great Commission. And that's what I want to, I want to focus on today. And it's, a, it's the commission given uh, to the church. And we think about the church, of course, we, we have to include those, those apostles, but not just those 12 or 11, but also the early church, the first church of Jerusalem, and every church thereafter. Of course, the Bible often calls this the church. And so it makes a reference to the fact uh, the commission was given uh, to the church. So God has given us a responsibility, uh, not just to this church, not just to the apostles, but to uh, every true church since the time of Christ. And this, this responsibility is to go and win people to Christ, evangelize them, baptize them, incorporate them into the church, and to disciple them or to teach them. And you know, the thing is, if churches are not strong, missions will not be strong. It's like a lot of things. If uh, someone said, if the family's not strong in our nation, our nation will not be strong. So the same is true, we talk about missions, and you cannot have a strong mission program unless you have strong churches. Now the fact is, there are a lot of churches today that have lost their focus. Uh, they're distracted, and they're overwhelmed by, by material or worldly things. And so that's a cost them as far as being a strong church. Other churches are, are sick, are dying, are dead. And so certainly they have uh, uh, become a burden uh, on, on mission work. So this message today is to encourage us to be a focused church and to be a healthy church. And I think that's why God gave us uh, some have said our marching orders in the Great Commission. Now, our church belongs to uh, the Baptist Missionary Association. In fact, we belong to that association on three levels. The national level, the state level, and what we would call the local level. Our local BMA is called the Landmark Association, which is made up basically of uh, the churches in the Nacogdoches area. On the state level, which encompasses the state of Texas, uh, the VMA, we have uh, several things that we are involved with. We have a school, uh, we have a children's home, we have a publications department, we have a missions department, and so that's the state level. On the national level, we have, we have a school, we have a missions work, we have a, a thing that inco incorporates the camps and the chaplaincy programs and things like that. So we as a church are part of the Baptist Missionary Association. Now, our association came to be in 1950. It was called at that time the North American Baptist Association. The name was changed to the Baptist Missionary Association in 1969. But uh, from the very beginning, in 1950, our association emphasized missions. Uh, some of the first places we had missionaries were in the area of Brazil, uh, Peru, and places like that. Uh, Mexico, we had missionaries there in the early years of the BMA. So the thing we need to remember is that we are part of a bigger association. We are part of a, a group of people uh, who are mission-minded, who enjoy mission work, and we support as a church mission work. Now, you know, we are probably different in some ways than other groups of Baptists, for instance, the Southern Baptists, or maybe independent Baptists and things like that. Uh, but when you get right down to it, most of our doctrine, the important parts of our doctrine, are the same. And if you want to know what we believe, I would tell you to go to the Bible. But if you need an outline of that, I can give you what we call our doctrinal statement. If you want to kind of see how our belief affects our behavior, we have a church coming on the back wall, and we try to adhere to, to those things. And that's some of the things that we participate in and we believe in. So I'm going to talk about today, just for a little while, I, if my voice will hold out, the idea of missions and a church that is involved in missions. Now when we look at uh, verses 19 and 20, of course Jesus is speaking. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. We often look at that passage of Scripture and we say the command there, the commission is to go. But that's not really the case. The command in that verse of scripture, from the little bit of grief that I had in seminary and using some commentaries, and just people that I've heard tell me this, that the really the command there is to make disciples. 
to make disciples. In fact, that word there says, go ye therefore and teach. The word teach there is mafetes, which means to make a disciple. And so this is the command to go and make disciples. The command is to make disciples. In fact, going, baptizing, and teaching are three in Greek participles that go along with the command to make disciples. And so we need to realize this is the commission that God gave to us and gave to every true church is that we are to make disciples and not just in our area, but the Bible says of all nations. We are to make disciples of all peoples. You know, it's sad to say, but Christianity is really not the fastest growing religion in the world today. Now, there are some other groups and other religions that are ahead of us in a lot of places. And you look at their efforts to make disciples, and they are working circles around Christianity in a lot of ways. But Jesus told the early church, I want you to go, and as you go, I want you to make disciples. So let's look at the three uh, things he talks about in accordance with making disciples. Of course, the first thing there is that we are to be going. And really, in the, in, in, in the original language, I guess it would read to us, as you are going, as you are going, make disciples. God gave instructions, or Christ gave instructions for us to go. Uh, so now, let's talk about that going and what it means. Certainly, there are some who are called specifically to go. And these would be the people that we, I guess, recognize as missionaries that are commissioned by our group or maybe any other group to go to another place, another town, another, another state, another country to share Christ with that group of people. So certainly God does tell people to go. Leave your home, leave your family, leave what you know, go and learn a language, go to this place and win these people to Christ. So certainly we, we have to uh, encourage and we have to support uh, missions on, on that level, uh, those who were called to go. And so that's what Jesus has done to the church right here. He said, there are some in like, when you read the history of the apostles, not many of them left the area of Jerusalem. They stayed, most of them close by in that area. And of course, really all of the apostles were Jews anyway. And so until Paul came along, who was, uh, I guess, commissioned or ordained or called to be a missionary to the Gentiles, and of course, we read about the life of Paul, and many churches were started in other places uh, because Paul had to start those churches. But he said we are to not be uh, uh, exclusive to the gospel for just us. We are to go to every people, every nation. Christ died for every man, woman, boy, and girl. The, 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 the Christ went to the cross so that all peoples could be saved. Uh, all groups and, and all nations could be saved. And so that's why we are to share the gospel with every nation, every group of people. I would tell you, not only just are some specific called to go, others are forced to go. And when you look at the history of the early church, the history of the early Jews here in the, in the New Testament times, I um, mean, there were many times when they were persecuted to the point that they had to flee for their life. About 70 AD, one of the emperors, one of the, the, the Caesars, you know, he was... He was so mean to the Jews that many of them had to leave. Many were put to death. Many had to escape with their life. And as they went, what did they do? They carried the gospel. And wherever they went, wherever they settled, uh, they gave the gospel to, the, to that group of people. And I know sometimes we're forced to go. Sometimes our circumstances mandate that we uh, leave our home where we grew up. And maybe our job moves us or maybe other stuff, things happen, circumstances happen. So we have to leave. And so what does Jesus tell us? As you go, as you're perhaps forced to go, the conditions are not favorable to you, but you have to go. As you go, you make disciples. As you go, you evangelize and tell people about Jesus. And then I would tell you, tell you a third when we talk about going. Certainly there's this idea of you and I today as we're going about our life. You know, God has blessed us with an opportunity perhaps. You chose to live where you live today. You chose to go to church where you go to church. You chose, you know, your your spouse, your family, or many things, many choices you have, and you chose those things. But the Bible still instructs us as Christians and as the church, as we go about our life, whatever that may involve with our families, our school, our work, 
our uh, circle of friends, we are to evangelize and tell people about Jesus. I mean, God has blessed us. I mean, I feel like God has blessed me by bringing me to this town. And uh, the, a lot of my kids would go to this school. And the same is true for you. But we still have a responsibility. Even though we have, we've got to choose some things and we're blessed with some opportunities, we still have a responsibility to make disciples. That's why we're involved in the church. <coughs> That's one of the things that we should do. A second thing we talk about going, but then we talk about baptizing. Baptizing. And the word in Greek is baptizo, which means to immerse, not to sprinkle, not to splash, but it's the idea of immersion, like we baptize in our church today. And so the church needs to make disciples, needs to, needs to uh, evangelize, win people to Christ, and it needs to incorporate them into his church. There are a lot of people, I've been saved, and that's all that counts. Well, that's right. I mean, that's maybe the most important thing. Uh, you have eternal heaven, you have eternal life, uh, you have that, that home in heaven, but you know, that's not what God called us to do as Christians. When he saved us, he gave us a responsibility. He expects there to be a commitment. And so baptism is, is like a, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a, a starting point. Maybe it's a, a point we can recognize. It doesn't save us, we know that. It's just a, a representation. It's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Every time we baptize someone in our church, we baptize a new Christian, it's just signifying to the world what Jesus did. That's what that person has done in their life. Forsaking everything and committing to follow Christ. So baptism is a picture. It's a picture of, of, of some important things. It's a, it's a command. I mean, we follow the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the command is given right here in Matthew 19 and 20. And so when we submit to be baptized, we are following the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you know, it's important because we talk about, well, you know, being a Christian and, and following God, and yet there's so many today who are not willing to be obedient to the command that Christ gives to be baptized. And, uh, you know, some people say, well, you know, you make that commitment that all the world knows <laughs> that you're a Christian. Well, is there anything really wrong with that? You know, I heard in some of those, uh, which they're having trouble with now, some of those in European countries, in those former communist block of countries, you know, uh, when the wall came down and we found there were people there who were worshiping the Lord, secret at that time, but now they can worship, worship Christ more openly, that uh, oftentimes when young people would come and be saved, their parents in the church would not let them be baptized until they were teenagers. Not because young people could not be baptized, not, or not, not be saved, not because eight, nine, ten years could not be saved, but it was the fact that they needed to realize the importance of baptism, and when you submit to that ordinance of baptism, it may mean a horrible, terrible sacrifice. I'm saying when you identify with Christ, and you identify with his church, there are a lot of places in the world that, are, that, are, that are, a death sentence is put upon your life right then. I mean, there are some countries where it is illegal to be a Christian. It is illegal to own a Bible. It is illegal to talk to people about Christ. And so I think sometimes we, we just say, okay, let's be baptized and get that done with and move on with the life. Listen, baptism is, is a picture. It's a following Christ command. It's also a picture of what Christ did for us, that we follow his leadership. It's also a commitment that we are committing to be a part of God's church and a part of his work. Identifying, uh, <coughs> saying to the whole world that from this point on, my life will be a life to follow Christ. I am his disciple. It's a shame because so many people today and so many church people today been saved, they've been baptized, and then that's it. And they think that's all that's required. I've heard about people who never go to church, they never never do anything, never have any connection with the church, and yet it's almost when you talk to them, oh yeah, I'm a church member. Well, I disagree with that statement. I disagree with that statement. 
there are some things that you know I guess you, you, you're involved with those things maybe you get a certificate and it says you belong to that organization for life there's not many like that in fact we had an old copy machine here uh, we had a lifetime contract on it that meant if anything happened we paid month or every year to have anything fixed under contract but we never used it I guess we had a good machine we didn't abuse it you know and it lasted a long time and the company sent us a notice and they said well we're not going to honor your lifetime contract anymore the machine didn't die we didn't die they just said we can't do it if nothing happened it would cost us it's not worth it to them and so let me tell you a lot of people like that you know they well i i joined the church i got baptized and that's for life in a way it is but let me tell you something if you don't keep that up and if you don't if you don't grow that and and help that to uh, to prosper in your own heart and life listen it's not going to mean much to you it's not going to mean much to you it's just to identify with something that really doesn't mean much to you the third thing he talks about there he uses the word teach or teaching again it's a different word the first word was mathetes which means to make a disciple that was the command this word here is didasco, didactic, we get that word. And it means to teach, to instruct. And so as a church, one of the things that we need to do is to teach those that are part of us. Those that we evangelize and baptize, we need to teach those people. And we teach them what? The truth from God's word. There are a lot of churches that don't teach the Bible. They teach the latest philosophy, the latest opinion, the latest magazine, the latest poll. But the Bible says we are instructed and commanded to teach the truth. That is the word of God. Listen, I, one, I guess one, one prayer that I have, and I'm, I'm, I'm fading fast here, but one prayer that I have, is I can finish the next five minutes. One prayer that I have is that people who are part of our church will learn about God and learn from the truth of God's word. And we do that from the pulpit. We do that in the Sunday school class, the WMA class. Uh, whatever organization, youth group, whatever organization we may have. Hopefully, and I prayerfully, I hope we use the Word of God. And there are a lot of good Christian books, and those things are fine for devotion that we use them, but it ought to all go back to the truth of God's Word. So the teaching we get, the teaching we teach in our church, should be based upon the Word of God. It should not be so be teaching them to grow. And that's why it's important to get people involved. In the ministry of the word of any church. We ought to be growing in God's word. We ought to be growing in our Christian faith. It, it's really a shame because we can we can quote every verse of the most popular country western song, but when it comes to some of the songs that we sing, we have to have a hymn book to hide behind because we don't know the words. And that's kind of like a sad commentary on the life of a Christian. Our favorite song should be Christian songs. Amen. Our favorite music should be Christian music and whatever genre you like, whether it's country gospel or contemporary Christian, but I'm just, my favorite are the, the old hymns. I just like the hymns. I like hymns that are that are sung well. When I listen to the radio Christian, I like to hear those songs um, sung by choirs and, and they do a good job. And so, but you know, to teach, we teach God's word, we teach in the church that people can grow. People can grow. And, uh, and that's, that's the response that the church has. And then third, we talk about teaching. The Dasco in the church, the teaching ministry of the church, we should teach by example. Teach by example. It's really a sad commentary on the church today that's kind of away from the Lord. The fact that so many scandals and horrible, terrible, sinful things happen inside the church as much as outside. And I'm talking about within the Christian circles as do outside Christian circles. If you talk about a gossip and slander and murder and hate and adultery and all these things, these should be things that happen in the world outside of the church, and yet they go on all the time in Christian circles. And that's just not right. That's not right. So we need to be a teaching church that teaches the truth of God's Word, that teaches other people can grow, and that teaches by example. J.R. Law, you've heard me mention his name before. Uh, he was a pastor that I helped and worked with in Corsicana when I first went there for uh, two or three years. Brother Law used to tell a story about he, he ran away from home when he was sixth in, in the sixth grade. 
And that's about as far in school as he got. One of eight, we did preach or two forever, only a sixth grade education. But before he was saved as just a young teenager, he would go to a place, a, a, a beer joint outside of the Mahaya area, and um, weekend nights, whatever, and, and, and a young person would go in there and drink and whatever. But he told me he, in, in that beer joint he would see the Sunday school superintendent and the Sunday school teacher and they're drinking and having, laughing and having a good time. You know, what kind of example is that? So, well, that, that's, you know, people ought not be looking at me, they ought to be looking at God. Well, that's true. But you know what? The Bible, we have a responsibility as a Christian and to the church to be a good example. If you're leading somebody away from Christ, or if you're calling someone not to come to Christ, the Bible said it was better, it would be better for you to hang a millstone around your neck and jump into the It would be better for you to commit suicide and to lead a young Christian or a non-Christian astray. That's pretty, pretty tough talk. But you know, we're called upon Christians as to walk a tough one. Sometimes the life that we have to lead is not easy. And that's why there are so many who, who fall out along the way. You know, and I was thinking about this other day, you know, we look at Baptists and, and we think, well, you know, there's too many restrictions, too many things, you know. A lot of people have gotten away from the name of Baptist in their church. They say, well, we really are a Baptist church. We just don't like the name because it drives people away. Well, I have a, I have a response to that. That's the way you feel. There's so many different factions and schisms today that began in the early uh, years of the church. That to call yourself a Baptist, in my opinion, is to identify with what you believe. Now, we accept surfboard riders and skateboard riders and motorcycle riders and horseback riders. You know, anybody who like that can come to our church and be welcome. But we use that name to identify ourselves because this is what we believe. And there are many we can call them denominations, and I believe they're Christian, but there are many groups that don't believe exactly like we do in a lot of things. For instance, the security of the believer, which is a very important doctrine to us as, as our group. Because, let me tell you something, if you're not, and apparently there are a lot of Baptists who are not sure, but if you're not sure about your salvation, you're not going to be sure about doing mission. How can you encourage somebody to come to Christ and have eternal life when you're not sure if you don't have it or not yourself. See what I'm saying? So that's why someone asked Brother Bill one time, you remember Frank Bill, someone asked him, well, Brother Bill, if you weren't a Baptist, what would you be? He said, I'd be ashamed. <laughs> I'm not saying we're the best. I'm not saying we're the only ones in, in heaven and, and, and lo and behold, sometimes the way some of the Baptists live are certainly not the best example. And I can understand why a lot of people don't want to join our ranks. But I'm just saying, think about the doctrine. Now, there are some groups of Baptists that really don't believe in some of the things that we believe in. And so you have to kind of look at some of them. It's good to have a have a doctrinal statement or a, a charter or whatever you want to call it and have your beliefs so that you can share them with them. And if you're not sure what you believe, you're not sure what we believe, and you, you talk to me, I have a little book that I can give you to help you with some of that understanding. But you can look at some of that stuff on the back wall back there. It'll kind of help you about how we behave, what we believe. And so I'm glad our church does mission work. But mission work is not just ordaining people, mission people to go to Brazil or Africa or Costa Rica. Our mission work is for every Christian. As we go about our daily life, some God will call specifically to go. Some will be forced to go. Some of you have had, maybe had to move here. Or maybe you have to move somewhere else because your job will dictate that you go. But Jesus said, as you go, you may not want to leave. But as you go, you carry Christ. When I left home, and I guess the, the point in my life, when I left home in my mind, was when I moved 30 miles away to Corsicana for my last year of, of, of junior college. I had rented an apartment with another guy from Fairfield. We had a couple more roommates, pretty good sized apartment. Uh, there in, in, in Corsicana, very close to the campus. And, uh, you know, I loaded up a little twin bed that I had to have for the apartment. Had a little night table, suitcase with some clothes. And the back of the pickup, and I pulled out. 
And boy, I tell you, my heart was just, I was just, I mean, it's like 30 miles, and I almost came up almost every night anyway, but still, I was moving out. That, that was a hard thing to do. Now, my mom said, she felt like I moved out when I came to Nacogdoches, but, which was two years later, or, or a year later. But um, sometimes life doesn't. Sometimes we grow up, we move on. Sometimes we have to move to a place that's not really our first choice. Some of us would like to stay in our hometown and not have to leave. But sometimes we do. And God said, as you go, even when it may not be favorable in the beginning, as you go, remember this. We have responsibility, a joy, to share Christ with others. And so some are called specifically to go to mission work. Some are called, and sometimes we're forced to go and live in another town, work in another job. But as we go, we take Christ to make disciples. Mm -hmm. Then sometimes all God wants us to do is to talk to our neighbor, talk to our coworker, or our fellow student about, about Christ. And we do all that and make disciples. We are responsible. So I'm glad our church is a mission-minded church. But you know what? A mission-minded church is not really a mission-minded church if it doesn't have mission-minded people. And so I hope today that God will impress upon your heart to realize the importance of mission work. Not just across the ocean, not just sending money or supporting missions in the VMA, but that every one of us have a not just a responsibility, but an opportunity and a joy to share what's happened to us with someone else. I watched Barney Fife when, or Don Knotts, we know him as Barney Fife, but he received one of those awards that people get for being on, uh, was that the Academy, or what is that, Oscars, for the TV shows? In fact, he received two of them during his, his uh, career in, on the Andy Griffin Show. The first time his name was called as the winner, he went up to receive his award, and he opened his, his, his I guess, his acceptance speech. He said, you know, he said, I really don't have a speech because I've always been a prepared loser. And I think there are a lot of Christians like that. You know, God has saved you and given the best thing you could ever have. But when you're called upon to share that, you're like, well, you know, I don't have anything to share. I don't have anything, any way to respond. And that's just not true. We all have that test of opportunity to share Christ and be a missionary to those around us. So thank you being a mission-minded church, and I hope today that you are a mission-minded person. And let me tell you this, the whole the whole uh, Great Commission, <laughs> the whole uh, scope of the VMA is, is, is hoping and praying that everyone that hears the gospel will be saved. And so that brings us to you today. You've been in church a long time, You've heard a lot of messages about salvation, what Christ did, You've heard a lot of messages about the church, but have you ever accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? I'm not talking about walking out. I'm not talking about raising your hand. I'm not talking about baptizing, having your name on the church roll. But have you accepted Christ? How sad it would be to be involved in a church and not even have the first, the first step, the first requirement to be a part of a church, and that's to be saved and know Jesus Christ. So I want to extend that invitation to you today, Church of Jesus. Now, maybe you are a Christian, and, and praise God for that. But God did not call us to be, to have our name just on a roll. To be a church member, to be a part of that means that we are active and involved, and we are involved in the mission work. So I pray today, God speaks to your heart and changes your mind about what your responsibility is, what your opportunity is as a Christian to share Christ. And if he's done that for you today, I'm going to give you the opportunity to share it with us, okay? We're going to have an invitation, Brother James Christian, if you'll come, and we're going to provide you with a time for decision. And if you've given your heart to Christ, or if you've made a decision in some way about following Christ, to be his disciple, or a commitment to go and make disciples, would you come and share that with us today so that we can be encouraged what God is doing in your life as we stand together and as we sing.